Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello. Where are you tuning in from? Please use the chat if you are so inclined and let us know. And I apologize in advance for the glare on my glasses. I can't figure out how to get rid of it. Otherwise, I will see nothing. So, so I'm in Seattle, and I think Tan is too. And yep. Ewan is in London, cooking and getting ready for a supper club tomorrow, or excuse me, for deliveries tomorrow. Where are you? Now, after a few more people get, hello, Seattle. After a few more people get tuned in, we'll get started. <coughs> Oakton, Virginia, welcome. <coughs> hello, hello. All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. We have a kitchen in the shop and do, during more normal times, we do all kinds of cooking classes and author talks in the shop. And for the moment, and probably for the foreseeable future, we have taken those author talks to Zoom. One of the great things about that is that um, it allows us to do talks like the one today where we are welcoming Yuen Lu, who is the author of this wonderful new book, Vietnamese, look at that cover, I mean, come on. And she's in London and we might not have otherwise been able to do that were it not for the wonders of technology and all the work that we've all done over the past year to get used to using it on a more regular basis. Ewan is going to be in conversation with Seattle Times writer Tan Vin. They are going to talk about Ewan's book and um, Vietnamese food in general, and they will leave time for questions at the end of the talk as well. So if you have questions for Ewan, please use the Q&A button to ask those, and that makes it a lot easier for me to keep track of those. Feel free to use the chat to talk to each other. Um, and then, like I said, just use that Q&A button for questions for you. And the book is of course available at booklarder.com. I will drop a link into the chat so that you can go there to purchase it if you'd like. Thank you to everyone who has done that so far. Um, you can support the talk by choosing to uh, buy the book from us. So thank you for that. We are also recording the talk today and we will share that with everyone who was registered so that you can either go back and watch it again on YouTube if you'd like or share it with others that you think might be interested. All right, and so with that, we are going to welcome, please join me in welcoming you and Lou and Tan Vin. Hi. Hello, greetings Hi. from Seattle, you Yuen. Hi, nice to meet you. time is in London now? It is seven o'clock in the evening. Uh, if there was any doubt that, that you were from London or not, if you check the cookbook, there's a fish and chip recipe. <laughs> Only a Londoner would do that. <laughs> <laughs> it is really good. I think all Vietnamese would love it. <laughs> they would. I would. I love fish and chips. I'm curious about the Vietnamese food in London. What's the scene like over there? From um, the restaurant scene. Well, there's um, there's quite a lot of Vietnamese restaurants in London um, sprouting up everywhere as the years goes by. But um, I think I'm still looking for a really, really, really good Vietnamese restaurant. Yeah, I mean, my supper club. Uh -huh, that's right. <laughs> well, you need to come to Seattle because I would say right now, unfortunately, before the pandemic, we had, I believe, an evolving and one of the best Vietnamese food scene. Uh, it was just evolving because I remember even like maybe five years ago, if you were not Vietnamese, I would say that 95% of our population would eat just bun mi and pho. Really? And it was until last year that it just evolved. Like you don't see all Americans eating just pho and bun mi. And it's just great to see that our food and our culture has evolved. Because now if you go to a Vietnamese restaurant here and in Portland, I would say even the West Coast, you see a lot of Hanoi dishes, like Bum Cha Hanoi. You see central dishes. You see Vietnamese desserts, like people aren't Vietnamese going to delis and going for the dessert, all these colorful desserts that used to freak them out. So I think things have changed so much 
And what I love about your book is you cover all this. You should say, hey, I do have a bun mi recipe. I do have a pho recipe, but there's this another world of Vietnamese food out there that you cover. So I'm so happy for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I am curious because you can't talk about Vietnamese food without talking about food, bun mi. And I'm curious, what is your ideal bun mi? What should goes um, in it? What do you look for? Well, I look for everything in a ban mi, otherwise it's not a ban mi. So first of all, it has to be the perfect baguette. Um, and sometimes you can't get a, per a perfect Vietnamese baguette. So a French baguette would do. So it has to be crispy on the outside, fluffy on the inside. So it's, it's a world of opposites. So crispy and crunchy. And then you have like the sour, sweet pickles of carrots or daikon. And then you have the refreshing cucumber and the crunch of that and the coriander. And then, I mean, a perfect one for me is probably roast pork belly or lemongrass beef. But I am really happy with an omelet inside. Yeah. yeah. So I would good. say, oh, sorry. I would say in, I don't know about London, the United States, especially in Seattle, when it comes to bun mi, there's only really pretty much two. One is the cold cut, the special, the number one, what have you. That's what a lot of people eat. And for hot sandwiches, there's always the grilled pork. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until last year in Seattle, and I would say around the West Coast, that a third sandwich has emerged, and that's the roast pork belly sandwich. Yeah. And it is essentially just a porchetta bun mi, and it's popping yeah. up everywhere. And I love that you have a recipe. And I'm telling readers, yeah. if you buy this book, if all you made was a roast pork belly sandwich, there it is, it's just delicious. If all you made was that, you got your money's worth because you make a piece of slab of pork belly using a recipe, you can do bun maize, falafel, you can do hash brown with eggs. And you mentioned what, noodles too. You do yours with noodles, right? So that with like noodles. The crispy pork, yeah. Yes. Like bun hai, it's the, it's the neck noodles that are stuck together like in the sheets. My daughter calls it, a blanket, blanket noodles. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's funny because I consider pork belly like the secret meat or secret ingredient for the Vietnamese and the Asian community because I'm dating myself, like maybe in the 80s and even 70s, Vietnamese people love to buy pork belly because it's cheap. It's like the cheapest yeah. cut, flavorful cut ever. And then David yeah. Chang came along and he started <laughs> like promoting pork belly buns and Everyone eats pork belly now. The price just skyrocketed. It costs so much now. And I blame <laughs> David Chang for ruining it for everybody because it's great. <laughs> um, uh, here's the pork belly recipe, by the way. There it is. Yes. Folks, I love it. It has that crackly skin. It has that layer of fat at the bottom. It just melts in your mouth. So I highly recommend this. If there's one recipe, that is my favorite. You win. Um, I was wondering, what about pho? Your recipe pho, I like it because it's easy. It's not intimidating. And if I say, there, if I could say if there's a theme across this, is that it's just so, it's not intimidating. It made me want to cook. I don't want to like overthink this. And I, I love how easy your pho recipe is. I was curious, what is the secret to good pho for you? Well, I, think. I think for me, um... It's the, the good quality beef. That's the first um, element. Uh, I really believe you have to get, if you can, like grass fed um, beef and from a well, um, well, from a good butcher. <laughs> um, who knows where um, the, the, the cow, you know, had spent their life and they were on good pastures and, and basically try not to use um, industrial farmed animals. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. Can I, I, I'm glad we're recording this because I'm gonna show everybody this part that you just mentioned because if I have a beef about pho, um, no pun intended, but if I have a beef about pho is the fact that here in Seattle, and I think in California, people have the same issue. And that is chefs do not use high quality beef in pho in Seattle and in other areas. And the reason why is because if you use high quality beef, you have to charge a lot of money for pho. And Seattle is not ready for that. They would get angry response on Yelp. So they don't always use high quality beef. 
And I bring this up because it's a sticking point because if you look like burgers, people buy a McDonald's burger cheap. They will buy a burger from a gastropub that costs four times as much. And they know the difference. They, they, they get the difference. And Vietnamese pho has not reached that point yet. We're still in the McDonald's phase where it has to be cheap. It has to be cheap. And I'm telling readers out there, listeners out there, do yourself a favor. If you love pho and you never had a good bowl of pho with fatty cuts of briskets or grass-fed beef, it is a game changer. It will change your life. And if you read her book, I love that you mentioned in your book, very high up, use high quality meat. Yeah, if, you, if you're going to spend all that time cooking, because with making a broth like pho, it takes, you know, kind of all day, really, or part, a good yeah. part of the afternoon. So you might as well um, just invest in it and make a lot, you know, make enough that would fit in your freezer so that you can, you know, in two weeks time, have it for breakfast. Um, and then in a month's time, have it for a midnight snack. So it's, it's just a really good investment to have. And, and it sort of tells also the farming industry that, you know, we, we want something else now. We care about how we live and, and it makes an impact and it makes a, a difference, however small. I yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's counterintuitive. I will not eat a cheap buff. Uh, and I would tell readers that, the, just like you mentioned, the way meat and cows are, are, are raised, it's not, the, the economic math on this does not work for cheap pho anymore. So I would be very <laughs> skeptical to eat a bowl of pho that was under 10 US dollars here. And it's like, yeah. again, highly encourage people to try pho, like seek out quality place like here in Seattle, Babar, Monsoon, game changer. There's nothing like it. Um, besides pho and banh mi, I know you cook a lot of Vietnamese food and I want you to know, what are the five essential ingredients for Vietnamese um, cooking for you? I think the first essential ingredient is fish sauce. You have to get a good bottle. It's as, as well with the meat, you know, you can't, you can't skip on, on getting a good bottle of fish sauce if you, if you can, because that makes a whole difference to everything. Um, if you use a cheaper grade of fish sauce, then it's okay, your food will taste okay. But if you use a higher end, a premium fish sauce, then it's just gonna taste amazing. And yeah, yeah it would just do you favors. What are the other ones? So I guess rice and noodles, um, and then something sour, like I always have some limes or lemons in the fridge um, and something sweet. Um, I try not to use sugar, uh, although, I do. I hardly ever use sugar because I always have a bottle of maple syrup or something that I can turn to a sweet sauce. Oh, great. And fish sauce. You said use high quality fish sauce. What brand do you use? I can only get three crabs in London. I can't get the red boat, um, but I use three crabs. <laughs> okay. I, I need to explain this to everybody. So I'm glad we're on the same boat. No, no pun intended. But in the United States, you're either a Red Boat fan or a three crab fan. And there is no in between. It's like the <laughs> Celtics against the Lakers in the 80s. It's like the Sharks versus the Jets in the 50s or what have you. There is no in between. And people are very, feel very strongly about this. And I'll give you an example. I was in a Vietnamese restaurant and I just happened to mention that I love Red Boat. I'm in the Red Boat camp. And a table next to me, a senior citizen says, just yelled out, said, you're wrong, son. Three crabs is better, fish sauce. And then another table jumped in. And before you know it, there was like a third of the room debating about who had the better fish sauce. It came to a point where the one guy was just like calling out the sous chef, the line cook said, to get him to settle this debate. <laughs> and it's so passionate. We're so passionate about our fish sauce. And yeah. I think the reason why is it's part of our culture, right? It's our DNA. It's, it's what Vietnamese cooking is about. Is it a big yeah. part of your pantry? I, I assume you some yeah. of the things you've done. I, I even put fish sauce in all my other cuisines. And, you know, when I was little, I used to make fun of my mom for putting fish sauce in a roast dinner or, you know, spaghetti. But I mean, I do that now. It, it, it's a game changer. It's just basically anchovy sauce. So it, it, if you put it in um, spaghetti bolognese, I mean, it just tastes so good. It's the same as just using some anchovies from the tin, but easier. <clears throat> 
And I, I, I should explain, because not everyone buy fish sauce. So I was just saying there are two camps. There are two major brands of like Pepsi and Coke. One mm -hmm. is Red Boat, which is I'm in that camp. And, and the other camp is Three Crabs. And how I would describe the two? Oh my God, I'm going to get so much. Yeah, how, what's the difference? Because I've never had Red Boat. So I've not. Yeah, I would I say, <clears throat> I have to be careful because I know the Red, the <laughs> Three Crab fan would just go bonkers. I'm going to get so much hate mail. Three Crab to me is more closer to traditional. I think it is saltier, it's brinier, it has more up, has more punch that people like. Mm -hmm. um, for me, Red Boat is more subtle. It's, people would say it's more gourmet, or I guess the hip word now is chef. Chef B has that certain subtleness that people yeah. like. So, and I think that's why, because of the contrast, like you either or, and it's such a heated debate. And that's <laughs> how it works here for us. But I didn't realize you couldn't get Red Boat. How'd you know about Red Bull then? Just... Oh, because I, I, you know, I, I read and I, I can see, you know, all the Americans using it and I, I really want to try it. Someone says they're going to send me some Red Boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, yeah, I just haven't, I think I, I might have had it when I've been in California, you know, at my family's and, and thinking, but probably then I wasn't a food writer. Um, yeah, I just, it's just everyone talks about it, don't they? I mean, here, the conversation is very limited regarding fish sauce. And nobody even knows that there was a grade, that there was a cheap kind and it was an expensive kind. And then there are like two counts, red boat or three crabs. I mean, we're not, we're totally not there in, in London. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, using the squid brand is, um, is what is acceptable. And to me, that is like, no. Like, I can't, yeah. I can't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides fish sauce, another ingredient that you mentioned in the state was rice. Um, I would say it's so misunderstood because I eat out pretty much every day. And I would say a lot of people do rice really badly, especially non-Asian restaurants. And I mm -hmm. love in your book, you have quite a few rice recipes. Yeah, Tell yeah. people what is the ideal rice. If you cook rice properly, what is the end result? Tell, tell people what it should look like and taste like. Okay, so if you really like rice, the best way to cook it is in a rice cooker. Um, I mean, I'm just really sorry, but it's just the best way for me. And uh, because it gets it to the perfect fluffy, not too wet, not too dry. And the bite of the grain is, from, I really love like almost sticky rice texture, but like it's kind of, like you can sink your teeth into it and then chew it a few times and then let it go. Um, but then I don't like the rice that's too dry where it sort of goes everywhere in your mouth. Um, so the perfect way to cook it for me is just in a rice cooker. And with depending on the rice grains you get, you know, you have to figure out the amount of water that you need. So obviously to never boil it at all. Yeah. I find that in the restaurants, um, they allow them to be on the mushy side, for some, not even not as bad as kanji, but almost in that texture. And then it's very disappointing. I, people don't do rice right here all the time. And we move to this movement where a lot of people just do coconut rice. There's no plain rice, it's coconut oh, rice. Yeah. <laughs> and I just like it. I don't yeah. want to do anything, I just want white rice. Yeah, because it has to be plain, because it has to, you know, it, it's the, it's the vessel that takes all of the, the other dishes that you have. Um, so if you've got coconut rice, then it would flavor what you're eating with it, like a fried fish and it just wouldn't match. Yeah, and so broken yeah. rice. Talk about gum <laughs> dum. Explain this I to me. I love broken rice. <laughs> yeah. And then I would tell readers, like, if you like a good pork chop with rice, I think this is one of the best dishes for pork chop. Wow. And you okay. why would you explain what broken <laughs> rice is? And for readers out there in Seattle, it is a very popular dish these days. If, if you go to a restaurant and there's a full menu, on the right side, there's usually a gum dum. Oh, you're so lucky. I wish we had that in London. I only ever have gum dum when I go to um, uh, Saigon because nobody really does it here apart from my mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's this, everyone. This is gum dum. So it's basically a pork chop with broken rice. So the rice grains are the um, just normal grains, but they, they were broken. So somebody just um, collected all of that together. And then I love it with a fried egg and a steamed egg terrine. 
yeah. and a lovely sweet sauce to go with it. It's just so nice. <laughs> But yeah, we talk about fish, fish sauce, fish sauce, just with the gum, dumb rice, that's just explode. It's just all these unami flavor. Oh, it's yeah. just a great <laughs> representation of how fish sauce should be used as far as I'm concerned, but I'm biased. <laughs> um, I was reading, rereading your book yesterday and I don't know the genius of that, your book. And I don't even, I don't even know if you noticed this, but you very slyly and subtly like mentioned from the beginning to the middle, to the end, there's a theme that you gently nudge and put in there, and that is be open. Don't be so strict about certain ingredients like broccoli. Use fresh herbs, use, use whatever is in season, but use what you have. Don't be such a stickler for a certain ingredient. And I love that because I think a lot of cookbooks are really strict. And I think we move we moved, you're, you're one of the cookbooks I've seen, and I've seen one, two, three, four others where they, they're more open, it's like, hey, swap things out. In fact, I think that's the exact wording, you're like swap out vegetables and keep an open mind. Um, tell me about that. Tell me some of the usual vegetables you use and tell me why you encourage people to be creative. Um, well, I think by nature, the Vietnamese do that, you know, uh, in Vietnam, and my mom does that. And wh wherever we immigrate, they do that because um, I, the Vietnamese are so resourceful, I, th I think, and, and they use what's available to them and they don't tend to waste. You know, my mum would keep hold of everything and, and, and um, use everything to the max and instead of wasting anything. And so instead of saying, oh, I can't cook this recipe because I don't have um, mustard greens, you know, the world, but I have watercress just use watercress, you know, it, it'll still be absolutely delicious. And, and vegetables are there to be used in season. And I, I don't encourage anyone to go and, you know, specifically buy something. And the only thing I would go out of my way for is really to make pho, <laughs> where you do have to have the correct ingredients if you want those correct flavors. But if you're doing dishes to eat with rice, like a stir fried vegetable or um, a simple noodle soup that doesn't particularly have any rules like pho does, um, then, you know, just go ahead and use what you've got because you, you, we shouldn't waste stuff. Yeah. Perfect example. In your book, you mentioned this great Shanghai stir fry noodle dish with broccoli. And unlike other couple of authors, you would jump and say, hey, but if you don't have broccoli, sub other green, sub and herbs. And I love that you keep driving that theme. And I wish more people would do this. It's a cookbook is just a guide. If you don't need to, short of baking, you don't need to follow every recipe or every ingredient to the tea. And I love that. Um, and and for, I you you were born in Vietnam, right? Or, I was. Yeah. For me, and I think I speak for every refugee who came to the United States, and I'm going to date myself like even 70s and 80s. One of the things that you notice as a Vietnamese refugee back then is there are no Asian ingredients in mainstream grocery stores. It's not like now we have an ethnic aisle with fish sauce and rice paper. You did not have Asian ingredients in grocery stores back there. So as a Vietnamese refugee, you had to improvise, use whatever is on the shelf and adapt yeah. to your dish. And I think that made my family a better cook. I, I think like you say in your book, I think it's good, right? It, it, it's yeah. broad the horizon. Yeah, that's what we had to do. We just had to use what was around. And um, and it, and also like, I would encourage people to, you know, not to spend so much on, on something and said, use something that's local and cheaper. Um, because when we were refugees, we didn't have any money either, but yet my mum would always be able to string together, you know, a caramelized fish with exactly. fish sauce. She would, you know, even though she, at the time she probably used a squid brand because that was always available. Or she probably went and got um, anchovies that she saw in a tin and then she mashed it up and sort of made some stuff out of it. So yeah. And, and this is not just a Vietnamese problem. It's just like every ethnic group has this challenge. Like I remember even in the 80s, like my Middle Eastern friends in school, they, didn't, they said they couldn't find chickpeas cans of chickpeas in stores. So everyone goes through this. And we're so lucky now where 
it's everywhere. It, even the mainstream grocery store, Whole Foods and Costco. Yeah. Costco has red boat in some parts of the country. So <laughs> it's so much more accessible now. So yeah. I kind of miss the old school cooking when we didn't have all the ingredients because I think I've become a better cook. I think most people in the refugee community become a better cook by not having all the ingredients in the grocery store. Yeah. And, and I've learned so much just from reading your book there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's good to reinvent things a little bit. And, and you know, you might discover something about a technique that you had to do because you, you know, didn't have a certain thing. So, yeah. yeah. Cause you use some unusual veggies that you wouldn't see in Vietnamese rest. Let's see, what was it um, artichoke or some a type yeah, of Jeru artichoke? Yeah, Jerusalem artichoke. I use quite a lot because um, I, I'm not a big fan of water chestnuts, you know, from the tin. I love it fresh, um, but you can't get that here. So I just thought, what can I use? And, you know, cause I eat out as well. And then I just thought, aha, <laughs> I got it. Um, so I replace all water chestnuts with Jerusalem artichoke because they're, you know, they're available and, and they just taste amazing. They do. And Pablo Nero and things like that. I, oh. I use. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of your recipes, you incorporate other cultures and so forth. Like I, I enjoy your flour with prawns and chives. Tell me about that one. Like tell me what cultures adapted to come up with that dish. Tell readers yeah, that about was, that. That was a little bit of Italian and a bit of uh, Japanese and a bit of Vietnamese. Um, those are my three favorite cuisines. So I just sort of blended it together because I, you know, I cook um, Japanese a lot and I love eating Japanese food out as well as, and I cook Italian a lot as well at home. So it's just a combination. And, um, and tell and, people, tell people like what that dish is. It's fried. So tell people the, what's Japanese um, about it, what's Italian about it. It's um, interesting. I love that you had it in there. I'm curious, so you can see. Can you see that? So it's fried courgette flowers. They're not, sorry, they're not fried. They are deep fried, I think. Even better. Oh my God. <laughs> like in a Everything's tempura good deep fried. So it's tempura uh, and then inside it's like a Vietnamese pork, um, sorry, prawn thing, like a, a mixture. And it's stuffed inside the flowers and then just use like the tempura um, technique with the fizzy water and then like in hot oil and then, yeah, and it's like a really tasty snack. I mean, when we shot this, we literally, as soon as we finished eating that, that was gone in like 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you eat that with by itself, with rice, noodle, or just by itself as a starter? So yeah, it could be a starter or, you know, it's, I had it once with, um, with noodles and it was just like a noodle salad. It was amazing. It's a good way of, uh, of treating yourself that. And, yeah. and cause they're flowers as well. And when you have guests around and you're serving them flowers, I think everyone feels really happy and delighted to have something crunchy. <laughs> yeah. And, and on noodles, you've been, you have a lot of recipes for noodles and you even have how to make egg noodles from scratch in the back, correct? Yeah. Yes, but the Italian way, <laughs> <laughs> which is, well, my way. It still tastes like noodles to me. Yeah. Um, I need to learn how to stretch noodles like some people. I don't know. I need to go to a school for that. Yeah. And you also have a recipe on how to make bread, bun me bread. Um, I do. I spent ages researching that, and I, I love it. And I made a success out of it. So I shared it in this book. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm so glad you did because I think in the bun me scene, especially in Seattle, especially now in California and other parts of the country, that's a bread you made. That looks great. Yeah, Mine looks nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> but it took a few tries. <laughs> <laughs> because here, like when bun me, sh bun me shops open in Seattle now, they all make their own bread. Because like it's just flour and water, it's cheap for them, and it's just eye candy. It helps draw on the crowd. There are very few bun me shops I see now that are opening in Seattle, or in Washington State, or even in California, where they don't make their own bun me. It's such a big thing now. They just oh, like that hot. London. I feel so behind. I, I love eating Vietnamese food in California, but it's, there's not not a patch of anything like that here. <laughs> <laughs> And what about noodles? 
is what's your favorite noodle dish? And you, oh, so many. Uh, I really like mean, you know, like with just vegetables. It's like glass noodles, just stir fried with vegetables and either fish sauce or soy sauce. Uh, what other noodles do I, I Singapore fried noodles. Just my favorite. Just could eat that so fast. And um, this I make quite often, just noodles and whatever greens. Like uh, my favorite greens are like mustard leaves. But you can use like watercress or courgettes. Do you call it zucchini in America? Um, yeah, any anything that's green, just add in, and then perhaps add loads of chili sauce afterwards. And see, that's what I mean. You're so subtle about this. Improvise <laughs> using greens you have. I love that. It's a theme yeah. throughout the book. I'm not even sure you realize you do you did that, and I didn't realize I read through your book again. I was like, oh, I I love that you drove home that point, and I I encourage other people to do this too. <laughs> Um, one of the big things I was surprised and so glad to see is you have a dessert chapter because the Vietnamese do not get the respect for their dessert. And it's like, no, and no, one no. of the most popular things these days with Vietnamese dessert is pandan. How do you mm -hmm. use that ingredient when you um, make Pandan, um, well, I make, um, I make a pandan cake. Oh, sorry, explain to people what pandan is the and pandan, the flavor. Pandan is, like a long leaf that it's kind of like um, a grass and it, it's the vanilla of the far east it's just so fragrant and lovely in sweet things as well as in savory things um so yeah it's like a it, you wouldn't call it a herb would you it's more no. just like a leaf i don't know some kind yeah, of grass. plant yeah it has a vanilla flavor it's strong uh, yeah yeah i would say that I think the reason why pandan is so popular with non-Vietnamese or non-Asian people now is it's such a familiar flavor. It's vanilla. Because yeah, if I yeah. were to feed people who aren't Asian or Vietnamese or familiar with pandan, it's like, oh, you made a vanilla scented dessert or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And what do you use in terms of to cook some of the dish, uh, some of the desserts? Um, so I, I make a pandan ice cream, so that's really easy with condensed milk and um, a bit of cream and then pandan essence. So basically you, you get, you buy the leaves, wash them, and then using the blender, just blend it up in either some water or coconut water, which is really nice. Then it adds a, another dimension to the pandan flavor. And then you squeeze out the, um, the leaves, you know, you pour it onto a sieve, squeeze out the juice and discard the the waste um, and that's your pandan extract or you can also buy um, if you can't get pandan leaves you can also buy these little pandan juice you know extracts essence <laughs> you can also get those yeah and as I was mentioning earlier like when people go to delis and I should say during the pandemic bun mees and Vietnamese deli have done booming business because it's takeout oh great picture that's the pandan ice cream. Yeah. I would say that, like, doing, sorry, there's an ambulance going across. I would say that Vietnamese restaurants have done just a booming, booming business through the pandemic with bun mees because it's to go, it's takeout, it's easy, it's affordable. And one of the things I've seen now is here in the United States, we used to have a table of like Vietnamese desserts, pandan desserts, tapioca base. And Americans or people who aren't Asian would freak out. They do not look at that table. They just ignore it and go straight for the bun me. And now yeah. you see more Americans like, oh yeah, I'll get this pan and cake or pan and dessert and, and these tapioca. And I think the reason why is, I think people are freaked out by our dessert. It has the sticky tapioca, squishy. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that the best thing that happened for Vietnamese desserts, the best thing that ever happened was bubble tea. Because oh. with bubble tea, you have that tapioca, you have that squishy, bouncy texture that used to freak out Americans when it comes to dessert. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, but it's just the best. Yeah. I think people get freaked out when it's, um like this is quite runny. So the teas are quite liquidy. So it's like a drink. Whereas if um, people get freaked out about the, um you know, stickier ones like- uh, Lime. Sticky yeah. Ones. Yeah, the slimy ones, which we love, but only 50% of the other 
of Westerners can understand. <laughs> exactly. And I think, and I think not just bubble tea, but mochi, I, I think that helps a lot. It introduced, it opened in one's mind like, oh, okay, it's sticky, it's slimy, and it's chewy. Because I think Vietnamese, I don't know if you found this, even like or savory or meat, we like it. Americans would call it grizzly, but we like to chew. Yeah. We like that chewy texture. And when it comes to dessert, it's like when you get something that's really panned into vanilla scented and you just chew, 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 it's just delicious. <laughs> yeah. And I and I'm so happy. I don't I don't like bubble tea, but I love that pretty much bubble tea is a game changer for Vimmy's dessert. Mm. Um, so great and, dessert. So many. There's just so much. Like when you go to Vietnam, you know, there will just be ladies just selling only desserts and my gosh, what should we have? It's just like so much choice. Yeah. Um, and so like when, you, I, was writing, when I was writing the book, I, I had to like get rid of like, I was only allowed say 10 recipes for dessert. And it was so difficult to narrow it down because there, there are so many splendid desserts and, and some are really um, healthy as well because there's so many nuts and beans and, you know, nutritious ingredients in it. Yeah, because with the French influence, you would think that it's all just French pastries for the Vietnamese. But, yeah. you know, we didn't we didn't have ovens, did we? In Saigon, not every household has yeah. an oven that could do French pastries. And so we focus on this whole characterization of dessert, tapioca based, sticky and so forth. That's sticky yeah. and squishy. So talk about that. Talk about Vietnamese desserts, because I think people have a sense, but they don't know much about it. Um, just think it's, like, cream, it's coconut, it's a panda. Yeah. So this is like a, I can't really see it, I think. Um, so this is a rice pudding with uh, black eyed beans. And that's like cooked down um, in coconut milk or coconut water. And that's really comforting. And, you know, when you cook it perfectly, there's that lovely bite as well that you sink your teeth into. It's like a blanket when it happens. That's, I think that's why we like the really chewy things. Um, not chewy as hard chewy, but soft chewy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like that lingering bite. It's kind of like it's, I want to say like it's bouncy, chewy. it's squishy, it's springy. Yeah, bouncy, yeah. elastic -y. Thank you, elastic -y. It's at that yeah. tapioca base. And then yeah. for the longest time, Vietnamese restaurants could not get Americans or non-Vietnamese people to order dessert because they, they, they just, I don't know, we, we like cakes, we like cookies, we like something that just has a bite to it almost that's sweet yeah. but then there's the famous creme caramel which um you know Delicious. is very vietnamese but i think westerners can understand <laughs> 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 so i used to serve this quite quite a lot because you know i used to serve like yeah like the sticky stuff and and then i hate it when i would go and pick up people's plates and no one you know would finish it so i ended up having to do like creme caramel all the time which is my favorite and things like like this is a pandan swiss roll oh my god it looks which, delicious which you find like in saigon in delis there's loads of um patisserie like this now and almost like a chiffon cake kind yeah, of it's like, a, it's yeah. A chiffon, so it's basically a chiffon recipe but just spread out into a tray cooked quite fast for, i would say um, yeah I would say that here in Seattle, in terms of pandan, that is one of the most popular dessert, especially with the young, I get to say, but young hip crowd or what you, whatever you call them, they love the pandan cake. They love the pandan texture. It's essentially, for lack of a better word, a vanilla cake, but I, it's yeah, much has such more. Than vanilla. Yeah. Huh? I, I haven't met a person who doesn't like pandan, like ever. And everyone is so impressed by the smell, the fragrance, and the, the flavor. It's more than vanilla. It's kind of like a herby, grassy vanilla. Like hey, van yes. if, if vanilla was a grass instead of a some kind of pod, that's what it is, I think. Yeah, and it's weird. My niece said this, and I, I actually agree. It all has almost like a bubblegum quality. As weird as that sound to me, like almost a bubblegum quality. And it goes so well with coconut and mung beans. It's just, it's very versatile. Um, mm -hmm. And here in Seattle, in the States, you see actually bartenders using that ingredient in cocktails. You see, like you say, in savory ingredients, in desserts. Yeah. It's not just, it used to be that if you want something, pandan, 
it's usually you have to go to a Vietnamese deli or an Asian Hong Kong deli or whatever. But now mainstream shops and bakery, they use that too. And I love that. It's... Oh. I wonder <laughs> how long it would be until, you know, Seattle, London is like Seattle and, uh, you know, LA in terms of Vietnamese food. I feel like we're probably a couple of decades off. <laughs> Why well, I, I we've been I've been chatting up a storm and I should I should open this up to readers here and I'm sorry should I jump in here I guess how do you know if you're oh sorry go ahead oh you want to do oh how do you know if you're getting a good fish sauce do you have a favorite brand I guess we kind of answer that the correct answer is Red Boat <laughs> uh, free crabs if you're in England um, and um, What's the, what, how you can tell basically is the price. So um, a bottle of free crabs is five pounds 50. That's about, I don't know, just under $10 in the US. How much is it there? Um, and then a squid brand sauce, which is the worst one, I think is about 90p, which is like less than a, about a dollar in the US. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's a difference really, you can tell. Um, I would say if you're, you only have fish sauce in the restaurant, it's not as pungent, but when you really buy the bottle, if you're not used to it, then you will know this right off. That's like, oh my God, you might squinch or something. It, it takes some getting used to. And I would say if you're a newcomer, I would start with Red Boat because it's more subtle. It's not so much a punch in your face, um, but three crabs. I, don't get me wrong. I do like it, but it's just my preference. Yeah, I mean, they, they sound like they're both good. So use one of them. It's fine, whichever you can get. Just yeah. don't use the lower grade ones. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, it's, it's like everything. And then, and I hate that when people look at the Vietnamese cultures, like they, it's like, it has to be a certain price range. I mean, it has to be a certain price. And Red Bull costs a lot more. <laughs> and it upsets a lot of Vietnamese. It's like, why do I have to pay more for this quality? But quality <laughs> yeah. matters and fish sauce matters, especially if you make a Vietnamese dish. Highly recommend Red Bull or Three Crabs. And I don't have, I'm not an investor. They don't sponsor me. But mm -hmm. I think everyone who cooks Vietnamese food will agree with this. It's either yeah. Three Crabs or Red Bull. Let's see, there's another question. It's also on fish sauce. Uh, I think we answer that. For the fish cake noodle soup recipe, uh, for fish, the regular state to add some fried fish cakes to the broth. Do you just leave those fish cakes in the broth? Well, yeah, because they're in your, um, what's it? So is it in the bowl or in the, in the, in the pot? I can't remember. Yes, yeah, it's for the fish broth. The regular state to add some fried fish cakes to the broth. You just yes, leave the fish cakes. In the broth. Just leave it there for it to seep out flavor. And so your broth would then taste like a little bit like your fish cakes. And then it all, you know, gels together then. Just leave it in there until you're ready to eat them. Ah. And we have another question. I just lost it all. No, you didn't lose it. <laughs> There's actually another one in the chat over here. Um, if you have more, if you just drop them in the Q&A, that's so helpful. Um, Julia would like to know what your favorite breakfast recipes are. Do you like pho? What else? I like pho, of course. And then I also really love leftovers of maca, which is this one for breakfast. It's crazy to eat a stew for breakfast, but oh my gosh, this is, this is just so warming and comforting especially on a winter's rainy day um and if you don't have noodles you know normally if i'm having it for breakfast i'll have it with a baguette just dip it in mop it up <laughs> yeah you went don't you find this to be the case i love eggs and bacon but i think american desserts i mean the breakfast is so provincial so narrow it's like asian desserts not just vietnamese it's just so much dessert sorry breakfast it's just so more interesting because we yeah. eat pho for breakfast in Vietnam. Yeah. But it's here in the United States. We eat and like you said, the, the, the dish you just showed, Baka, it's just, yeah, it's so much yeah. more interesting. It is. It's sort of like, it, you know, these dishes kind of, like if you have a chicken curry with a baguette for breakfast, it sort of just makes your day better. It's, mm. it's you're having like loads of vegetables and then the, the, the lemongrass, ginger and the curry, just sort of so uplifting. 
you know, so it's kind of like a, a nice little kick start to the day, I believe. Yeah, I don't know how we get like other people to see that. It, it's weird because we, we have such a conception here about what breakfast should be. If it's not cereal, it's always eggs and bacon yeah. and toast. And I it can know. be so much more interesting. Not just like check out other cultures. I encourage people to explore and go yeah. to Book Lord and, and buy other cookbooks and just read and see what they have for breakfast. It will change your mind. It's like, wow, oh, you eat rice, you eat like steak and beef and charcuterie and yeah. Yeah, and well, it's a, it's a popular belief that with the Vietnamese that you should eat something warm when you wake up anyway, um, and not like a cold cereal. I think that's a bit unheard of because you, you, you're you supposed to wake up your, your senses and something cold is just gonna sort of keep you down and cold. <laughs> oh, I see a question about Maggie. Maggie, Maggie. I can. Maggie. Know, I, I see Maggie like Vietnamese people. Maggie, is that what it's called? Do you <laughs> use that? And how do you feel about it? Oh, I love. I love Maggie, Maggie, or whatever it is. I just. I just think I use it. I do actually. If I have a fried uh, egg in the morning, I will put some Maggie on as well with some black pepper. Um, and it's great in recipes like shaking beef, the famous uh, shaking beef recipe. Yes. Um, it just, it's, I don't know if it's uh, what's in it, the like MSG or something, it just makes that's so a shaking beef. Um, it just makes it taste, it just gives that umami sense, you know, yeah. it just makes everything taste yeah. a little bit better. I think we like Maggi, the same reason why we like fish sauce, we Vietnamese people, and that is, it's a big unami punch. It's really, it's mm -hmm. just like, that has that texture and that yeah. flavor. And you make some a shaken beef, like your family think that's the secret ingredient for a yes. great shaken beef, right? Yes, my, my uncle in, in Huntington Beach. So kind of your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I would say 10 years ago, no one knew what shaking beef was. And then like Charlie Fan and the Slanted Door introduced it to like the mainstream non-Vietnamese people and it just exploded. And now it's on everyone's menu. Yeah. And it's just, and they would use the filet mignon cubes of filet mignon, but I don't think you even need that. It's a, mm -hmm. like, what other steak would you recommend for that? Um, well, you can have bavette, which is like a cheaper cut. Um, but I, I love using for this, like something like ribeye, if I'm feeling luxurious, or even filet is, is amazing because you're just shaking it for a few seconds. Um, you, you're not, you know, you're not gonna make anything well done or anything. So, so any really, any, anything that you can get that like even rump tips are really good, but I always get something that's a bit fatty I like my fats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And not to keep on harping on, on pho, but you need, when you're eating pho, you need like a lot of fat. I want like it to be glistening. I just want a little yeah. like puddles of fat. I want my <laughs> mouth to be just like <laughs> covered, dripping in fat. And yeah, it's, yeah. Exactly that is it? not your enemy, people. It is good. It's good for you. It's good for it's flavor. Fat. Yeah. That's only your enemy when you're using the um, manufactured fat, like margarine or, you know, the man-made fats, I think. But I'm not a scientist. <laughs> yeah. Spring rolls. Yeah, y'all. Yeah, y'all. I think that is always a winner. Like for you, what makes a good yeah, y'all? Huh? Um, the crispiness. My mouth is watering. I'm hungry. So I have nothing to eat. Um, obviously the fish sauce, the dipping sauce is really important. Um, but what really makes it, I think, is a, an array of herbs, the herb basket and the leaves. Um, I, I, you know, um, like the nice lettuce leaves, not iceberg, but things to wrap it in. Um, and the crispy paper, the crunch, and then what's inside, I don't mind if it's vegetarian or like plenty of seafood. I think the the flavor is just basically the rice paper, isn't it? <laughs> it's the <laughs> fried rice paper that I love. So yeah. Okay, uh, filling for day y'all shrimp and crab or just shrimp or no shrimp, just pork. How do you do day y'all? I would never. I would never do just pork. I'm not a fan of like just pork, um, like uh, mixtures. Um, I would. I love. Uh, a bit of prawns, 
Scallop. <laughs> Sometimes razor clam. Scallop. Oh, I, I didn't yeah. think about that. Yeah. Um, again, like any seafood that you have that's available. So don't feel restricted. I mean, I've had it with octopus inside and that was lovely. Octopus and prawns, yum. Oh, wow, I, would, I never would guess. So that's it, you wrap up the, the spring roll in a wrap with loads of herbs and then you dip it in the sauce. Yeah, and I love it so much with the rice paper. It's blistery and it's bubbly. And it's just, once you yeah. dip that in the fish sauce, it's just this yeah. unami punch, it just soaks up the rice <laughs> paper. Oh my God. Just and it, it's got to have like, like lots of good vegetables in it as well. So I don't like it with just the seafood or the meat. And, you know, it has to have like that crunch mm -hmm. of carrots and, you know, it's just like loads of crunchy things, like even bean sprouts, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it's really nice in the spring roll because, you know, the textures. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned it, and that is, I think what's distinct about Vietnamese food is we mm. always have a plate of herbs, a lot of different herbs, maybe five or six different herbs and lettuce. That is so much a part of a Vietnamese meal. Like when you serve Vietnamese food, herbs and lettuce takes up a lot of real estate on a plate. There's more herbs than yeah. meat. Thank you. Like that. <laughs> So for, for the people who put, put that up there again, Ewan, for people who aren't as familiar with Vietnamese food, this is what a table should look like when you mm -hmm. serve Vietnamese food. There should be a lot of greens and should take up most of the real estate on the table and in the dish. Like Europe, I mean, meat, especially beef, smaller portions. What about the herbs and the starch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then loads of... Um vegetable sides as well. But if you're, if you're doing a thing like a bun sale, like a crispy, like that one, then, you know, the purpose of, of, of that basket of herbs is, is, you know, it assists it. If you just eat it on its own, like it might be nice for one crepe, but it gets a little bit boring. So right. if you eat it with loads of vegetables and herbs and the abundance of flavor, not only does it counterbalance because it's quite unhealthy for you to eat so many fried crepes, but then you find yourself eating more salad than you ever would have without that fried crepe. And it just carries you over and you have another one and another one. You have a favorite herbs? Like what's your must to herbs? If like I go to your house for dinner, you put me out a plate of herbs and lettuce. Is there one favorite herb for you? Or the one um, that you think is distinctive? I really wonderful? like Rao rum, which is um, either laksa leaf or hot mint, I, I, or Vietnamese coriander. I absolutely love that one. It goes so well with chicken and fish, and it's a bit spicy as well. Yeah, I was going to tell you, tell people the, the flavor profile. Yeah, spicy. It's like a basil, spicy basil that tastes like a mild, like there's a coriander taste in it as well, but it, there's more of like a spicy sort of... Um, I don't know how to. No, 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 that's happen. fine. <laughs> and what about lettuce? What kind of lettuce would you use? Um, you would put I, out a salad plate. Um, I can never eat uh, iceberg lettuce, but I love all sorts of other lettuces. Like um, there's loads of Italian lettuces, which are like in lovely colors like radicchio and, um, you know, they're pink and purple and green, like the bitter ones. There's all, all types of, of leaves that have flavor other than iceberg. Yeah. You yeah. mentioned in your book, British vegetables, I believe. <laughs> what does that mean? What is it? What are British vegetables? British vegetables are like cauliflower, um, broccoli. I think broccoli is a British vegetable. Like purple sprouting broccoli, um, leeks. What else? I know. Imagine my grocery store. <laughs> you guys have that as well, right? And uh, maybe like rocket. Rocket's quite Italian. Yeah, just whatever vegetables that you find in your local area is the vegetables that you should be using. Ah, uh, and there is one question that one of my friends uh, uh, asked me to ask you. Almost forgot. And pho. When you make pho at home, yeah, you win. Uh, do you find that the taste change the day later? It's like a stew, does it taste better? Does it taste different? What do you think? 
I'm, and I'm talking. We're talking about like, you make a vat of pho at home. And you yeah. eat it one day, and you eat the next day, and the next day. There you but, go. Um, no, I I absolutely find that it tastes different the next day, and sometimes I have to go back and you know re-spice it and just rejig it a bit, just add things to it. So, yeah, it does. You think it? It's different, but does it taste better? It's like a stew. Does it taste better with time, or you just have to recalibrate? Or no, I don't think it tastes better with time. I think it fades a bit, so that's why I add a little bit more to it when I go back to it. I think um, I think it it really does fade, and, and and also think the longer you cook it, the more flavors you take out of it. So I don't really believe when everyone says, oh, this has been cooking for 24 hours, it must be so great. And I, I think, no, it's not, because you've just, it's vanished now, gone, died. <laughs> right. Are we running out of time? Am I yeah, we're real close. Do you, did you have anything else you wanted to make sure you asked, Ewan? Um, no, no, I'm good, well, I think. <laughs> I just want to emphasize, I'm telling people out there when it comes to pho, if you just high-end pho, fatty briskets, marble cut, just try it once. I know it's expensive, but it will blow your mind. It drives me crazy, Ewan, because I think like here in the United States, ramen has so much respect in terms of gourmet yeah. food. Yeah. But then when it comes to pho, it's, yeah, it's street food. They don't want to pay more for it. And Is it because it started out being like a cheap bowl of pho and no one could detach themselves away from it being cheap like 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, it's just like... Tacos, like, you know, people, I think for a while, were used to cheap tacos. And now that like, you have mainstream restaurants, you're just using like gourmet or fancy cut of meat and they charge more for tacos. And I want to see that with pho. And for all one who's, everyone who's listening out there, I encourage you, like Monsoon has one, Babar has one. And it is a game changer. If you love pho, you need to eat pho with good quality beef and it will blow your mind. Yeah. Especially if you're using the rare one. If you're using the rare beef on top, then you must yes. use a really nice piece of steak. Exactly. We're on the same page. You need to come <laughs> to Seattle. Please come to Seattle. And oh, I would love to. I'd love to visit Book Larder. It's just one of my favorite shops, although I have not never been there. Oh, that's really kind. Well, we would love to have you anytime. Hopefully, oh, we'll all be traveling a bit more very soon. So That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yes, come, come and see me if you're in London. No, I'll be there in July, hopefully. As long oh, as good. I goes well. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I'm I'm actually might be in London in June or July. So I want to check out. Oh, the we up. There you go. <laughs> what a beautiful book. It's so thank beautiful. You. you and congratulations. Um Tom, thank, thank you. you so much for your time and for the great interview. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you everyone for joining us. Ewan is actually sending us book plates. And so we will have signed copies. I understand Ewan. Okay. <laughs> and I so we'll that. have signed copies of the book very soon. So, um, and the, the link is in the uh, show notes or you can just go to booklarder.com. Thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations again, Ewan. Thank you, Tan. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a lovely day. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.